Well, hello everyone. Philip Shields here. Welcome to Light on the Rock. When we read the stories in the Gospels about Jesus Christ, we hear that he healed so many people. Hundreds and hundreds of people were healed. And then after, after his death and resurrection, uh, were there a lot of people being healed in the uh, early church? Uh, yeah, we're going to read about some of that. My question today is, are you hearing about wonderful, dramatic healing still going on today? in the church, among people you know or people you hear about. I'm going to do that today. I'm going to share a lot of stories, uh, several stories, as much as I have time for, that I've seen, that I've been involved in, that I've heard about, about the fact that God still heals today to His glory and to His credit. Luke 9, verse 1 and 2. Luke 9, verses 1 and 2. And then He called His twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons, and to cure, to heal diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. I want you to notice something here. He did not send them out to pray for the sick. He sent them out to heal the sick. Do you hear the difference? It's a big difference. He sent us out to heal the sick. You know, you shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall be healed. One of the things said at the end of one of the Gospels. And if anyone among you is sick, let him call the elders of the church in a prayer of faith. Anointing with oil in the prayer of faith will heal the sick. So uh, Christ healed and uh, he sent his disciples out to heal. And they did. And they were very excited when they came back because, wow, it's just happening. Uh, even demons obey us and do what we say. Do you believe God still wants to heal? Are you receiving healing when you ask for prayers for healing? Um, do you believe God still is giving power and authority to his disciples to heal? So hello everyone again. Philip Shields is here. I'm going to show you that dramatic healings are still going on, are still happening from time to time, even though we rarely seem to heal a dramatic story. I'm going to give you several dramatic stories today. And not to my own glory, to the glory of God Almighty, to the glory of Jesus Christ. Powerful healings that I'm aware of. God still definitely heals today. Now, be sure you're hearing the audio version and not just the notes, because the notes will miss a lot of the pictures. I'm hoping to have pictures of the ones I'm talking about, if I can get, get the pictures in time and uh, send to you. So before I go any further, I hope you do realize we have each experienced a very, very powerful healing, a powerful miracle in our lives. All of us who are, who are in Christ and have experienced this, whether you realize it this way or not, or even con are conscious of it, I want to make you conscious of it. It's a miracle greater than uh, all the ten plagues, greater than the Red Sea parting, greater than Jesus walking on water. And it involves you. You know what it is? that God the Father himself, God Most High, our Abba, dear Father, and his Son Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, have come and dwelt, made their abode in me and in you, and are transforming us, are changing us, are making us more like him, are absolutely uh, preparing us for the kingdom of God. That's a huge miracle. That's a huge miracle that he's transforming us. And besides that, I'm convinced that God is no doubt performing a lot of miracles we don't even know he's performing. I mean, you maybe, maybe you didn't ever get COVID. You know, someone spluttering next to you, coughing, sneezing, blowing their nose, and you're kind of in a group or whatever, and you never got COVID, but that person later, yeah, I have COVID, that's why I'm here, trying to get checked, and you never got it. Maybe God was uh, healing you right there, or keeping a barrier up against you. Sometimes we're, 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 we're people who experience dramatic miracles on the way back from the feast in 2021. We're coming back to Phoenix from Prescott. And um, anyway, the, the traffic, we're on a freeway near Phoenix. All lanes were full of cars. I, I was following a pickup truck and it was carrying something behind it there. And there are cars beside me and ahead of me and behind me. And suddenly, what it was carrying, about the size of a washing machine, 
okay, about the size of a washing machine, dryer, something like that, fell off for like 30 feet in front of me. I wasn't tailgating, so I wasn't right there, but neither was I far away. It was like 30 feet in front of me. Boom, it falls off. There's no way I shouldn't have hit that thing. And yet somehow, in the very split second, I went around it somehow, unaware of what I was even doing. I went around it, and we were fine. Carol says to me, honey, that was some driving. And I paused for quite a while, and I said, that wasn't me. I don't even know what happened. I don't remember what happened, because there was a car next to me, car behind me, car to my, my left and right, and somehow we didn't hit it. I still don't know what happened, but I know it was a miracle. So I want to be sure that you all understand this sermon is to the glory of God. That's my whole point and purpose. And I want to make sure you understand God is still powerfully healing people here and there. And if he's not, it's not his fault. Okay, it's us. And I want to admit, also admit, so you know it's not to my glory, that most of the people still that I pray for do not get healed. I want that to change. I want it to change very badly. So this sermon, I'm preaching at myself. I'm preaching at myself. Why aren't we getting more healings? Why isn't it more certain that, that God is involved in our lives in this way? Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith, or trust, belief, other synonyms for faith, comes by what is heard, what we hear. So I want to make sure you hear some things today that I hope will strengthen your faith in Christ our healer and Yeshua, Messiah, the Word of God. Hearing God's Word, you bet. Now, sometimes we can hear God's Word being preached to us, so if you have an audible Bible or something like that, I think we can also hear God's Word by each one of us telling and retelling stories of miracles and healings in the hearing of others, so that as people hear these things, they understand about those ten plagues. You know, the early Israelites, they didn't have the book of Exodus. And so what happened was someone was saying, Grandpa told us, or Great Grandpa told us about this story, they, that the whole sea opened up. And there were walls of water, 70, 90 stories high. And we went across on dry land. And then the Egyptians came across, and God let all that water crash down on them. And people believed. People knew the stories because people were telling the stories. So I'm going to tell the stories of God's wonderful, merciful healings so you understand God does heal today. Telling and retelling of the stories. But I think one of the biggest reasons we have less healings, we have too much unbelief going on. That unbelief is being fed by this notion that God doesn't heal today like he normally did in the past. That perception, if you repeat it, hear it, believe it, is going to feed your unbelief. Don't listen to that. It might be true generally that God's not healing like he used to, but don't think about that. That's unbelief the more you let that stick in your mind. I'm going, to, I'm going to be talking about ways we get unbelief in our head and don't even know it sometimes in the next sermon. But I, I, I want us to understand that God wants to heal us. And I don't mean just that the body's healing itself. You know, you have the flu, you get prayed for, and you're still sick for the day two, three, and four, and five, but then you finally get over and, and you say, God has healed me, hallelujah, praise God. And maybe that was just the body doing its normal thing and healing itself. Or maybe God was healing you. But my point was it wasn't right away with the amen. It wasn't even the next day or the day after or the day after. Uh, I'm not necessarily talking about that. I don't want to put those down necessarily either. But um, uh, Or sometimes we pray for a really good surgeon and the surgery went well and now my knee replacement's great and I'm taking, taking the therapy now. Uh, Okay, I, I, I'm not talking about healing like that. Although, God be praised, uh, if, if you had a good surgeon and you had a good knee replacement or hip replacement and are healed, fantastic. I won't take anything away from that. Now, however, I remember in a church that I was attending years ago, 
I was in the audience and our pastor got up and made the statement, it's clear that God does not heal today like he used to. And I went up afterwards and I said his name and I said, so what you're telling me, I repeated what he said, so what you're telling me is that if I'm sick or my kids are sick or need to be prayed for, there's, there's no point in calling for you. And he got mad at me for saying that. I said, well, God either heals or he doesn't. If you don't believe God's healing anymore like he used to, then that means you don't believe. And so what's the point in me asking you for anointing? I got in big trouble for that. And I've even heard a minister say that in all the many decades he's been a pastor and a minister, he's never seen a single healing, the way I'm describing, especially instant. Never seen a single one. We'll talk more about that in part two, in the unbelief. And, and, <laughs> and the more he believes that, the more he'll never see it. Because our unbelief feeds the lack of healing. So it's time we talk about the God who heals and is healings, and healings are happening. I'm going to tell several stories I prayed for people and my own body of being healed. I'm going to tell several. I'm going to tell you some of the stories I've heard about. Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17. Here's a little bit more about Jesus' ministry. Matthew 8, verse 16 and 17. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, saying he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. What he's saying here, as he healed people, he took upon himself their sicknesses and their infirmities and transferred to them his health and his, his well-being. Did you get that? He healed not just some, but all who were sick. He took on himself their infirmities, gave him in exchange health. Matthew 12, 15. Matthew 12, 15. But when Jesus knew it, he himself withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Healed them all. It doesn't say he had a big, long questionnaire. Have you been a good boy? Have you gone to church services, to the synagogue every Sabbath? Have you accepted me? Do you believe in me as your Savior? No, he just healed them all. That was Jesus. Then in Acts 5, verses 14 to 16, we find that this was continuing even with the apostles after Christ's resurrection, when he went back to heaven. It wasn't just Jesus able to do this. Acts 5, verses 14 to 16, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So they brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter, just his shadow might pass over them, implying very strongly here that, that that's all it needed, all that was needed to be healed. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And they... This is now the apostles I'm talking about, not Jesus. They were all healed. All. Not most. Not some. They were all healed. Now we know there were some. Paul had a thorn in the flesh if that was a physical ailment. We're not sure if it was physical sickness or something else that wasn't taken away. And Trophimus was left in Malta sick. And Titus, well maybe that... Yeah, it was Trophimus. And then Timothy had his often infirmity. So uh, over time, there were some that weren't always instantly healed. Okay, hear me now. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But were all of these who were being healed, were they all devout believers who believed in God's law and kept it and accepted Jesus as Savior? Were we, uh, we're just told they brought their sick people in. They were all healed. No questionnaire. Later, Paul went to Malta in Acts 28, verses 8 and 9. And there was a leader there in Malta named Publius. Um, he lay sick of a fever and dysentery. And Paul went in there, prayed for him, laid his hands on him, and healed him. And when this was done, the rest of the island, who had uh, the rest of those on the island, when they heard about this, 
if they had diseases, they said, hey, we got to go to Paul. He's healing people. They were healed. A lot of healing going on. Were all those people uh, believers in Christ, Sabbath keepers, obedient? Were they full of love? Did their, were their marriages wonderful? We don't know. We know they came to be healed and they were healed. 1 Peter 2.24. So what are we doing wrong that this isn't happening and it's not happening today? What are we doing wrong and how can we correct it and get back to faith and healing and see the things? And I hope the sermon will be, uh, the three sermons I'm going to give on it, the second one's going to be on the power of unbelief. The third one is the power of belief, of faith. And I'm hoping that this one here, the, the telling, the uh, strengthening your faith, faith comes by the hearing of the word. You're going to hear some stories here in just another minute. 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins, talking about Jesus, and his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. By whose stripes you were healed. You were healed. Some translations say, by whose stripes you have been healed. And I've heard ministers say that's to be taken spiritually. We're healed spiritually. It doesn't mean we were all healed physically. So again, we pack in more unbelief into our heads. Stop it. If we're healed, we're healed. Sometimes, though, I mean, that same word healed is what I just read to you about Paul healing Publius and the people in Malta, about the shadow of Peter healing people. Not just spiritually. Don't buy, for, don't buy into that. It's a bunch of garbage. Don't buy into that. We're healed spiritually as well, sure, but don't take away from the physical healing. There's so much to say about healing, miracles, faith, in the coming sermons. Don't miss them. Make sure you let other people know about the series. Get the word out, because people have to hear this. Before my stories of healings, let's understand a few more things. We're probably being healed of a lot of things we don't even know about. May God, maybe God kept you from getting COVID. Someone was spluttering, sneezing, and blowing their nose and coughing all around you in a group. And then even admitted that she had COVID. And was there for some treatment. And... You, uh, you never got it. Maybe God even healed you that way. There are times we're healed, we don't even know it. And the other thing is, great miracles do not make you a man of God. The false prophet of Revelation 13, remember, verse 11 and 12 is going to have so many powerful miracles that people are going to follow him because he's going to be able to call down fire from heaven. He's going to be able to make an an image, an idol, speak. It's going to be astounding what he can do. Many will be so amazed by what he's doing that if possible, he comes close to even deceiving the very elect, we're told in Mark 13, 22, if it were possible, because false Christ will come and deceive even the very elect if possible. That's how powerful some of their miracles will be. So miracles don't make you a powerful son of God, okay? Including me, all of us. It's nice to have them, but we got to get the balance on it. So let's talk about some dramatic healings I've been involved in at the time I have. All of this is to glorify God. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Jesus. The first one is a man and his wife out in Moses Lake, Washington. His name is Steve Bruns, and his wife is Linda Bruns. I called them. They gave me permission to use their name. They said they're still amazed by that powerful uh, story. It was around 2013 or so, a small group of us, only about 40 of us or so, were gathered for the Feast of Tabernacles in a little place in Colorado called Cripple Creek. I think it was south of Colorado Springs. Cripple Creek. There was a couple there from central Washington State. The man's name was Steve he was around 60, I believe, at the time. And anyway, he'd had a massive stroke prior to the feast, but he was still there. And his wife, Linda, had a very sore back. I don't remember why she had a sore back now. 
but might have been a sciatica, it could have been a ruptured disc, it could have been a number of things, strained muscles or or whatever. I don't pulled muscles. I don't know what it was, but she could barely bend over. A lot of pain. Steve, the man, walked very, very slowly. If you've seen somebody with a, a bad stroke, uh, my brother's had a couple strokes, and his whole right side is immovable. And so even with my brother, I had to kind of hang on to him. I'd, grab, I'd be behind and grab him by the belt uh, from behind you know, at the waist and just kind of make sure he doesn't fall because they can fall. He walked. So anyway, Steve walked slowly. He was very, very weak. And uh, I'd known Steve from before, and he had a nice, big, uh, masculine voice. But this time his voice was high, kind of up like this when he would talk, a result of the stroke. And if he ever got into a conversation with you, he was likely to forget what he had started saying in mid-sentence. So it was affecting his brain, it was affecting his mind, it was affecting his voice. He couldn't walk. He was very, very slow and weak. And like I say, his wife Linda had an extremely sore back. On the eighth day, we have a seven-day Feast of Tabernacles, then you have the eighth day. The feast coordinator had asked me if I would mind doing some anointing. So I made sure I had my oil. Seven people came up to be anointed. The whole rest of the flock, about 30-some more people, came around. and never seen it done quite this way. We weren't in a private room. We were out there in the open. And uh, as many as could lay hands on him, not just me, that's the way they did it, but I laid my hands on Steve, and they, whoever could, laid their hands on his body someplace. We all prayed together. Um, seven of them with various issues. Steve was the first one I prayed for. And then the second one was his wife, Linda. And I anointed them with olive oil in prayer, like it says to do. And then I prayed for the remaining five, and the whole congregation was present as the prayers were being said and done, and several laid hands on each one. As far as I could tell, my level of faith was the same for all seven. Talk about myself. Shortly after that, we immediately all sat down for church services. This was a very interactive kind of style of service. People could raise their hands and ask a question or make a comment. The feast coordinator was speaking right after the anointings. He himself had been anointed as well. Anyway, Steve Bruns raised his hand and frankly, I think most of us felt like, well, here goes another waste of time. He won't remember his question by the time he gets a few words out. That was a carnal bad reaction, but that was what we thought. Uh, my reaction, this isn't going to go well, expecting a high voice and that he'd lose his train of thought. But he raised his hand and then he said, you know, over here in Exodus 12, in verse 12, it says that I will... I mean, his voice was deep and low and strong. He didn't lose his train of thought. I think most of us had whiplash, turning our heads so quickly like that to see, whoa, is that Steve? Because his voice used to be high like this, and he was weak. He didn't lose his train of thought. Right after services, he was so excited because he knew he'd been healed. We all knew it. But there were some stairs nearby, and he ran up and down the stairs a couple times, saying, look, I've been healed. I've been healed. We all can see it. No more weakness. Voice was fine. Memory and brain, mind was fine. Praise God. His wife, Linda, who could barely bend over at all, was also out there bending over, touching her toes without back pain. So he and his wife were both instantly, perfectly healed. Seen by around 40 people. For whatever reason, and I don't know why, but the other five were not, at least not dramatically healed. Maybe they were healed later that I don't know about. And I don't know why. They all seem like wonderful people, full of faith. I didn't detect any lack of doubt. I don't think my faith changed, but two of the seven were healed, five were not. Later on that day, but I'm just saying, here's a guy, I know stroke, my sisters, my brothers had an awful, awful stroke, my mom died of stroke, I hate stroke, 
Later on, we were taking down, you know, after sundown, we were taking the uh, everything apart, putting the chairs away, and Steve had gone home already, or, or wasn't there anyway, and he'd left behind his two box speakers. And uh, so I was trying to find someone who lived near him who could take these speakers back to him, and they did. So a few days later, I called Steve, and I'll be very honest with you. I wanted to see what I was calling about was to see if he got the box speakers. But I also, because healings were so rare, I also wanted to make sure that this healing had stuck to my shame. <laughs> I apologize. Had the healing stuck? Was it still good? So I called him up. Steve answers the phone, and he says, Hello! And I'm thinking, Oh, no! And then he paused, and then he said, Gotcha, Shields! Gotcha! Admit it! I gotcha! I gotcha! <laughs> uh, and then he told me how, he, he told me how the neighbors had been all amazed at how he and Linda just walk around the neighborhood fine. See, God still heals today. Steve and Linda Bruns in Moses Lake will attest to it. Encouraged by the joy of this dramatic instant healing, it's so encouraging when you have a healing like that. I prayed for people with strokes. I did pray for people with strokes after that, including my brother, who had two big, big strokes. They weren't healed. My brother, there's a story about him, though. I want to tell you about that, too. My brother is one I'd prayed for without healing. And he has had two massive strokes, like I said. When he was 58, another one when he was around 65. He's 73 now, as I tell this. At the time that I'm telling the story, his wife also had Alzheimer's. Early onset Alzheimer's. We were trying to get some financial help for my brother. He just didn't have enough money. We were hoping there was some federal program that we could get him on. We went from place to place, um, but he made a couple hundred dollars more than what was allowed to get federal aid to qualify. He was so discouraged. He even said to me, I wonder if God ever even hears my prayers anymore, Philip. My brother's a man of God. He, he, he is. And yet he was so discouraged. He made that comment. I just, I, I don't know if God ever hears me anymore. That night, after I dropped him off and went to my motel, I prayed a lot for him. I remember rolling out of bed at least four or five or six times that night and just praying beside my bed, Oh, Father in heaven, hear my prayer for my brother. Father, he needs to know that you hear him. He needs to know. He needs to know. Please, Somehow, let him know that you still hear his voice. And I'd sure love to see you heal him. I'd sure love to see that. That was my prayer over and over that night. Next morning, we continued our quest to try to find some way to get some federal assistance. We No luck. Prayed about that too. No luck. No answer to that prayer. At lunchtime, I said, Hey, Lauren, have you ever been to Panera Bread? place my wife and I like to go, Panera Bread. There was one in Ventura. I don't know if it's still open. I think it is on Telephone Road, if I remember. And the Panera Bread, we placed our order. He'd never been there before. I said, don't worry about it. I'll buy. And up against the wall, we noticed a woman, just kind of, kind of noticed her, a Hispanic lady, a Spanish lady, in a Panera restaurant uniform. I presume she was just overseeing everything, supervising, watching everything. She stayed there a minute or two. We found a table, took our food, and, or the food came, and you know how it is in Panera. Anyway, at some point, she came to our table, and she introduced herself. And then she called to my brother by name, and his wife by name. We had never met. She said she'd been sent to us to give Lauren, my brother, some news, a message. She said, I have some good news, and I have some, good, some news that's not so good. She said the good news 
Well, she was sent to tell you, Lauren, that God does know you, hear your prayers, loves you. But for whatever his reasons, and he didn't tell me, Lauren, why, he wanted me to let you know, don't get discouraged if you're not healed, because he has his reasons for not healing you right now. And your wife, Dorella, also is not going to be healed of her Alzheimer's. And Dorella has since died. So that was the bad news, the not so good news. I was found the whole thing, what on earth is going on? She knows their name, she's telling them what their condition is and that God hears them. And so my brother invited her to sit down with us and she did, and we talked a few minutes. And then she said she had to get up, get up. My brother had to eventually at some point take his wife to the bathroom. So after lunch, I got up to try to find the lady again to thank her. And so I went up and I asked for this Hispanic lady who was there in the other room. And the manager's busy and he's saying, I, I don't have anybody like that. And so he calls everybody over, six, seven of them or whatever. He's, any of these? I said, no. I said, has somebody left? No, he said, has anybody? We don't have someone like that. I said, well, let me describe. She was standing by the wall there supervising, I guess. She was wa just watching. She says, that never happens. We never have someone just standing by a wall watching. I said, then she came and sat down with us and for maybe five minutes and, and chatted with us. He said, there again, we never, ever let our people just go and sit down with uh, the customers. We don't do it. And then he looked at his staff and said, did any of you see anybody in our uniform go sit down with this guy over there on that table? And they all said, no, we never saw that. All right. So by that time, I'd noticed Lauren had come back with his wife. I sat down and I said, I don't know how to tell you this, Lauren, but I think you and I have just had an interaction with a Hispanic female angel. So even though he wasn't healed, I thought that was a remarkable story to share with you. Now there are more I can tell you about. This next story, I talked to the lady, the mother of the little preemie I'm about to tell you about. I talked to her just a couple nights ago. I haven't talked to her for 26 years. Her name is Michelle. I wanted to be sure that I had the story all straight. That I had her permission to use her name and find out what's been happening. About 26 years ago, her mother, Sherry, called me and said, Philip, I'd like to, if you would kindly, please go pray for and anoint my daughter. She's in this such and such hospital. And I called the other minister and he won't go. I said, why not? She said, well, because she doesn't attend church. She got pregnant out of wedlock and et cetera, et cetera. And so they thought, no, we're not going to go pray for her. She's not a church member. She's not obedient to God. So he won't go. But what's happened is her water broke. She was pregnant and her water broke two days ago. And she had a dry breech birth of a preemie baby, just five months old, 23 weeks old. The baby needs to be prayed for, and my daughter, who's having some hemorrhaging and other problems going on, needs to be prayed for. Would you go please pray for them? I said, I'm, I'm on my way. In her words on the phone with me the other night, she says, I was a bad girl. And yet, the healing and the miracle that happened was one of the most dramatic I've ever heard and seen. In the new covenant, Christ is now our righteousness. That's why Paul says in Philippians 3 verses 9 and 10, I don't want my own righteousness, which is from the law, but the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ. And the end of Romans 3, the end of Romans 4, and the end of Romans 5 all talks about, they all talk about, they all talk about how God has given us his righteousness. Romans 5, 17 talks about the gift of God's righteousness. So I wasn't concerned, 
by God not hearing the prayer. Anyway, back in 1997 is when all this was going on. So Michelle was in mid-20s, about 25 years old. She'd given breech dry birth to a preemie. The preemie was five months in the womb, now out, in an incubator. And Michelle was hemorrhaging. Her preemie was 23 weeks along. Ladies especially, pay attention, 23 weeks along. And was a mere one pound, four ounces. I try to get a picture of this if I can. And if I can, we'll be showing it right now. I try to get a picture of this little preemie. They called her Nikki, N-I-K-I. And I went to the preemie ward first to anoint the baby girl. One pound, four ounces. You guys have no idea. It looked like red hamburger. I remember that. As I put on my gown and gloves, looking at it in the incubator, the doctor came in and approached me brusquely, asking, what are, who are you and what are you going to do? I said, I'm Philip Shields. I'm the minister for Michelle, and I'm going to pray for healing of this little girl and for Michelle after that. And he came up to me and he poked me right in the chest. Bang, just like that one time. And he says, now don't you go giving her any hope. There is no way that, that little preemie is coming out of this alive in the next, next day or two. That's all. That's all she has, a day or two. There's no chance that she'll survive this. So don't give her any hope. I was getting angrier by that. And I said, you know what, I'm almost grateful that you said that because God loves it when people say he can't do something. I'm not going to be the one healing her. God is. I said, now, if you don't believe she can be healed, please let me pray for her. So he went off in a huff. I don't like to anoint someone or pray for someone when there's unbelief. As you'll hear in part two, even Jesus scooted out the people who had unbelief. Jairus' daughter made them all leave the room, except I think he had his three apostles or disciples with him. That was it. Don't be giving Michelle any false hopes. That made me angry. Anyway, I gently anointed this poor little baby. One pound, four ounces. Do we have a picture of her? I hope we do. I'm going to try to put one up. The doctor gave her zero chance of surviving that. Zero chance. So, I was confident that Nikki would be fine, the baby, the preemie. And then from there, I went to Michelle's room. Her mom, Sherry, was up against one wall, and then her boyfriend, who'd gotten her pregnant, was up against the other wall, uh, sitting in a bench, as I recall it, uh, you know, where you could sleep in, if need be. And in between the two of them was her bed, Michelle's bed. And so I came in, a little cheerful. Hey, I prayed for Nikki, and she's going to be fine. I really believe that, I said. And as I walked in, I grabbed him, Michelle's feet. I just grabbed him and kind of shook him. And as I did so, she sat upright as much as she could. And her boyfriend stood up. And her mom stood up. And I thought, I really thought at the time, they think I'm being a little too forward to grab her feet. It's all under blankets and sheets and things. So anyway, I eased myself around to her head and she looks at me and she says, I've been healed. I've, I've just been healed. I said, what do you mean? I haven't prayed for you yet. And she said, all I know is that when you grabbed my feet, I felt this surge of really lots of power and energy that went up from my feet to my head back down to my feet in about a second. As soon as you touch me, I know I've been healed. And then the boyfriend said, didn't you see it? I said, see what? He said, when you touched her feet, there was this bright white light. They all attest to this. Bright white light that went from her feet to her head and back to her feet again. Her, mom's, her mom said she saw the same thing. And I said, where was I? I didn't feel any energy. I didn't see any light. But that was very, very exciting. And I prayed for her. And she was healed. Nikki, of course, being so premature, 
continued to be in there for quite a while. I think a hundred some days later, they let her go home. And Nikki today is a 26 year old, beautiful young woman, still short, about five, three or four, and has a baby of her own. Praise God, huh? Praise God. I wish now I'd gone back to the hospital once the baby was released to meet the doctor and say, see, there is a God who heals. But I, I don't know, I didn't do it, but I wish now I had. My cousin Michael also called me recently about a friend of theirs named Mandy, who had a very similar story. And you know what? I don't know if I got the email in time. Let me see real quickly if I got an email from them. I, I asked them for the story, the name. Now I don't see it. Anyway, back to this. But a lady named Mandy, her daughter had given birth to twins that were preemie. And there was some complication and, and uh, given a very low chance of surviving twins. Also at five and a half months and uh, one pound, seven ounce was one of them. I remember that. I don't remember their names. They're home now. They're well now. I know my cousin Michael prayed for them. And Je Je Jeannie, his wife, Jeanette, Jeannie prayed for her, the, 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 the daughter, the granddaughters and the twins and all that. Miracles still happen. That's why I'm so against abortion. You have us working so hard to keep these alive. And they're so precious, so special. So wonderful. Um, in my notes, I might say more if I hear more details on that. I have other dramatic stories. How's our time doing? Let's see. I've got my own story when I was about 46 years old, and I'm 70 now as I give this. I had a full battery of tests. It was about time and blood work and so on. And then I was maybe a half hour, 40 minutes away from my doctor's office when my phone rang. And the clinic was saying, doctor, why don't you in here stats right now, right now. I said, what on earth? I was just there. Well, we know, but she needs to talk over some things with you. Please come on in. I said, please tell me what it is. Finally, the doctor got on the phone and said, get your butt in here, please, right now. And she was angry that she had to be interrupted. And I should have just gone. Something urgent and important. Once I was in the office, the doctor said, okay, I'm going to tell you. We want to definitely do more tests, and they did. And it looks to me like you have cancer, possibly stage four cancer. We'll know with further testing. Stage four cancer of the liver and your pancreas. Pancreatic cancer, liver cancer combined. Stage four means it's already... Uh, metastasizing, spreading around. By the look of it, it could be stage four. And I remember a little tear forming up in my eyes, and, and I said, oh, wow, I think my son at the time was 11, 12 years old, I think 11. And I just said, that means my son's going to grow up without a father? She so said, you might have three or four months to live. You need to get your, you need to get your affairs in order. Wow, I didn't feel all that bad, but she said, you know, I have this stage four cancer. So I had more tests. It was stage four. I didn't even tell my wife for a while. I just prayed real hard, finally started telling, asking some people that I felt were people of faith. And I think that's very important, personally, that you don't just do a general everyone pray you don't know how many people praying in an everyone pray who really have faith. So I asked for three or four people whom I felt would have faith, please pray for me and with me. And after some tests and some more tests, I then had another appointment with another cancer specialist doctor in the hospital. This is a couple months later. And... I'm sitting there, you know how you have this little couch-like thing that they put you on and they give you this gown with no back to it, your butt's exposed. <laughs> so I had that and I'm sitting, sitting down, waiting for the doctor to come in. 
Finally, the doctor came in, flung the doors open. It was the kind of door where you had two sides. Flung the doors open. He had a maybe an inch and a half of papers in the left hand and just a few papers in the right hand. And when he came in, he said, where have you been going? Who have you been seeing? What have you been doing? And I said, what? What do you mean? He says, well, in this hand here are all the all the studies and all the tests on you until now, and you are in deep, deep trouble. And in this hand over here, the most recent tests, and all of the stuff in his left hand are gone. There is no cancer. There is no pancreatic cancer. There is no liver cancer. We talked about it some more. I want to make sure it really was me. Had him check the Social Security number and all that. So, I mean, I was astounded too. But all of that was gone. So I said, well, I've gone to see another doctor. He said, well, that's what I want to know. Who, who, who? And I said, I went to Dr. Jesus. <laughs> he smiled and chuckled. He says, so you're a believer? I said, yes, doctor. Yes, sir, I am. I said, are you? He said, yes, I sure am. I said, well, it seems like Dr. Jesus was able to heal me. He gave me a big hug. And he says, well, I have to go, but you've been healed. And as he walked out, he said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And I'll add another one, praise the Lord. So I know God heals. And yet I have other unhealed issues in my life. I have some diabetes and sleep apnea and tinnitus and blood pressure issues. I'm hoping and praying, expecting that even those will go. There's another story I have involving my son, Jonathan. As a late teen, again, he's 35 now, so this goes back some years too. Something had happened where he had fallen off, I think it was a pickup truck, onto the road real hard, banged his head real hard on the road, scraped his face. And so I had my wife take him to the hospital. He wanted just to sleep. He said, he's fine, just let me sleep. I said, no, don't let him sleep. Have him be checked out. He'd hit his head pretty hard. And he had an intracranial hematoma, which means bleeding of the brain. It was serious. You look up uh, bleeding on the brain and uh, Google it, you'll find that it could be life-threatening. And so Carol stayed with him that night. They found several brain bleeds on his brain. Several brain bleeds. Normally they would, if it's serious enough, they would go in and with surgery try to drain the blood or else you could die. Carol stayed with him that night. I prayed that night a lot. And any time you have bleeding inside the skull, it is an emergency. It is serious. So when the new tests were done the next day, the next morning, all the hematoma, all the brain bleed was gone, had vanished. No surgery, no medication. God had heard my prayers, my wife's prayers. He was completely healed. No after effects, no, pro no problems. Praise you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise you, Father. Another time in Fredericton, Eastern Canada, an older couple who lived a few miles from us called me and the lady said her husband couldn't move. He was in the, he sat down in his recliner. Now everything is locked up. So the way she put it, everything's locked up. He can't move his back, his body. It's all locked up. And he was sitting in the recliner, couldn't move. In fact, when I got there, they're only a few miles away. When I got there, she said she, in fact, had called an ambulance because it was getting pretty serious, they thought. I said, well, let's pray right away then. So we prayed. And during the prayer, we all heard three loud clicks. Where's my mic? Three loud clicks like that. I hope you can hear that. And upon the amen, he started moving. He says, I've been healed. I said, I know. I heard the clicks. 
God heard our prayer. I could go on with more examples. About five or six years ago, again, I had a bunch of routine tests. Doctor wanted some more tests, so we did. Then I was called in again. And every single one, he said, of your major organs is inflamed. Your heart, your pancreas, your liver, your spleen, they're all inflamed. I said, what does that mean? He said, "Not nothing good. Something's terribly wrong also with your blood. Let's do some further testing. Anyway, I was told I had multiple myeloma, which is a cancer of the plasma cells. Multiple myeloma is a cancer that forms with the white blood cells that's supposed to be, supposed to be something that's protecting you. Uh, it helps you fight infections. Antibodies find and attack germs. But when you have multiple myeloma, cancerous plasma cells build up in the bone marrow. The doctor also wanted me to get a brain scan while I was at it, because for some reason I don't understand. He asked me to take the brain scan because he felt I just might, on top of everything else, have a brain tumor. So I did the MRI, you go in this tube with all the racket noise they make, you know. You're not allowed to move. Anyway, the result of that was there was nothing there. And I laughed when they said that. I said, well, my wife says that sometimes, <laughs> that there's nothing in there. No, he said, I don't mean your brain. He says, there's no tumor. But anyway, uh, then a few weeks later, I got a phone call reminding me of my appointment with the Florida Cancer Institute or Florida Cancer Specialist and Research Institute, something like that, to remind me of my appointment. And I remember hanging up and saying, Cancer Institute? Because when you say multiple myeloma, unless you really are a doctor or somebody, you don't even know really for sure what that is. Well, I went to go see the specialist doctor, and she looked at all my most recent tests. I remember her words. It was a lady doctor. She says, I don't know why you're here. All the issues in your previous tests are all gone. Everything's normal. Your blood is fine. Your organs are all fine. And that was like six years ago. I also had a very severe and painful plantar fasciitis. That's where the nerve endings at the front of your, where your toes are, and, and, and it, it goes under the sole of the feet and connects up to where the heel is. Both sides of that had been torn. I was playing pickleball or something and just sudden movements and all that. And even though it was painful, I kept playing and it tore these. Anyway, finally got to where I needed to walk with a cane. It was so painful, I couldn't walk on one foot at all. And went to go see the podiatrist. Basically, he said, you're going to need to take this shot. He goes, showed me this huge needle that they can shoot into the heel. I think he said every month. And he said, that will relieve the pain. The, the, the shot's very painful, he said, but then you'll feel a lot less pain for a while. But you probably are going to have to walk with a walker or a cane the rest of your life. You certainly aren't going to be able to play pickleball or sports anymore. And I remember thinking in my mind, no, I'm not, going to, <laughs> not putting up with that. And prayed about it, massaged my feet a lot. Hurt like crazy for, I'm thinking, several weeks. And then one morning I woke up. I kept praying. One morning I woke up and all the pain was gone. It's been gone ever since. So yes, God still heals. Next time I want to go into one of the biggest things that keeps us from being healed, and it's unbelief. Unbelief kills your chance of being healed. And I'll go into this next time in more detail, but the story in Mark 9, when a man came to Jesus and said, my son, he, he's got a demon or something that makes him flop on the ground and convulse him, uh, convulsions and, and seizures and throws him in the fire in the water and I took him to your disciples. They couldn't heal him. That's in Mark 9, verses 17 to 29. 
we'll go ahead and post it up. And, um, but they could not cast out this demon. And he answered them in verse 19 and says, Oh, faithless, you unbelieving generation, how long will I be with you? How long have I had to bear with you? They brought the boy to Christ. And when he saw him, the evil spirit immediately convulsed him. He fell on the ground, wallowed, foaming at the mouth. He asked the father, how long has he been like this? He said, really, from childhood. And he's often thrown him in the fire, sometimes in the water. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. We're going to talk a lot more about that in the next two sermons. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, said, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him, enter him no more. And the spirit cried out, convulsed him gently, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so many thought he was dead. Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, by, and he arose. But what, I'm, what I want to get out, first of all, he said this kind goes, doesn't go out except by prayer and fasting. The NIV and the newer translations all remove the phrase and fasting. By prayer and fasting. But what I want here is when he asked the Father, if, if you believe all things are possible, back in verse 24, you can see it up here. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, Lord, I believe. Um, help my unbelief. I'm going to explain that more next time, that in all of us we have, I think, kind of like a Dr. Jekyll and Hyde thing going on in our hearts, where in one hand we believe. We have faith. We're going to ask for healing. On the other hand, we wonder if, if this will take. We wonder if it will happen. We wonder if God's going to hear us. We wonder if it's God's will. And all the things that are unbelief. We'll talk about that more next time. I also want to introduce Mark 6, verses 1, 6, Mark 6, 1 to 6. From there he went to his own country, to Nazareth. When Sabbath had come, he taught, and they were all astonished. Wasn't this the kid we knew who, isn't he the son of the carpenter? Um, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, and so on. So he was a carpenter in his own right. And so they were offended by him. The end of verse 3. But Jesus said, A prophet's not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, in his own house. Now look at verse 5. He could do... Who are we talking about here? We're talking about God. And the word God became flesh. God in the flesh could do no mighty work there. None. Except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their lack of faith, their unbelief. Even God in the flesh could do but a few mighty work because of unbelief. So we'll talk about that next time. Be sure you get other people to listen to this first one and then be ready for the second one. And that'll be coming up shortly. To God be the glory and the honor and the praise. Father in heaven, we come before you and I just ask in Jesus' name as we raise our hands in prayer and worship and love and we bow our heads to you and we just ask you in Jesus' name to hear this prayer and that all who are hearing this sermon will begin to Cast out and rebuke the unbelief that we all have. We have a mix of belief and unbelief. Rebuke that out. Start to remember that we can have our faith strengthened as we hear these stories. And these are all powerful stories of healings. There's so many more. And we just pray that you will begin now to actively work your healings all around the world in your people. Thank you. We praise you, Jesus, our healer. Thank you, Jesus, for being our healer. Thank you that you bore our by your stripes we were healed and you bore our sicknesses upon yourself thank you thank you so much help us now see and heal and be healed and see more healings have faith in you have faith in you father 
in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.